San Jose State is, is uh, in my, by my grading system, I'm very strict between a C plus and a B. In other words, we're not doing bad, that we're not doing great, okay? I know we can do better. And basically, I do this, I, I, I say this anecdotally. In other words, I meet with many students who, um, who are not able to achieve or are having challenges achieving their educational career and in some cases are not being fulfilled as human beings. In other words, they want to do something, but, and me, Lily, and whoever else, we're, we're trying to encourage them. So in other words, we're still trying, all the people that care about you guys, all the people that care about y'all and your educational achievement, we're still trying to smooth the way so that you can achieve your educational career and whatever other goals you have. By that, I mean that many students aspire to make a difference in the world and by virtue of that, their community. Okay, so what you, what you know, what your values are do matter to us. So share them, share them with us, share them tonight. Don't be afraid to dream and say, I want my community, I want to transform it. Um, and I know it's kind of hard to think that far away because of COVID, because of financial issues, because of legal issues, because of political climate. But I encourage you to use this session today as as to kind of reset that mind frame and especially because in a week from now we hope we hope to have uh a new president you know uh, at least be named and then we have a couple of months before we actually put the new president in place so that we can all then uh not just because he's a democrat or you know I'm, I'm, again i'm being optimistic excuse me if i'm getting my political uh pulpit here but just not because he's a Democrat, but because we also got to hold him accountable. We voted, we got to hold whoever comes into office accountable. And so if we hold them accountable, then there is hope for a better future. Okay, so, so there is, you know, this is not a, perhaps a good time to reset that, that mindset that maybe in the past few months has been un poco aguitado, kind of a little depressed and, you know, and hard to stay upbeat at times. So let's hopefully use this opportunity today with this platica this talk uh, that's, and we have two fabulous persons uh, that are gonna, that are gonna be sharing their, their ideas with you. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank our committee. Our committee is myself, um, Lily, Ging, uh, Ging, <laughs> Lily from the Chicano Latino Resource Center and, and Dr. Uh, Vicky Gomez from the um, uh, Public Health uh, Program at San Jose State. We put together, we put our brains together and we came up with this idea of, uh, inviting a very valuable resource to us, which is Dr. Rosalia Mendoza, uh, to, to share her, her wisdom, her knowledge, and her experience. And, and hopefully in the process, just give you that, that extra bit of motivation you need to, to continue forward. So about Dr. Rosalia Mendoza, uh, I met her a few years back when she was uh, a biology major at the University of California, Berkeley. And, and so I asked her, at that time I was working for UC Davis School of Medicine, and I asked her, so, so yeah, tell me about yourself. And I'm from Coachella. I'm studying entomology here at, and, I, and she said, I'm actually the curator of the entomology museum at UC Berkeley. And I said, I was a bio major, though. entomology, isn't that insects? She goes, yeah, that's insects. I don't know how many people know that. And so I said, so what do you want to do with that? She goes, I thought she was going to say graduate school, uh, you know, PhD. And she goes, I want to be a doctor. Whoa, so that went on to a whole different level of platicas to how she can, uh, you know, use that, that interest in science uh, to, 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 uh, to meet her goals to become a, a doctor. And, and she also mentioned she wanted to help her community. She comes from a farm work community down in the Coachella Valley. And so uh, she was very interesting from the very get go. So all I did was encourage her, give her a plan. She then implemented that plan. And uh, part of that plan was to connect her with a group of other colleagues uh, who are who are pre-med at, at UC Berkeley, and they were they collected. They were known as the uh, Chicano Latino um, and Health Education CHE, for as an acronym. So collectively, they supported each other. Uh, you know, they challenged each other to be better, to have the community, and many of them uh, were able to realize their number one graduate, number two go to to get into a graduate program of their choice uh, and then do and do wonderful things to change community. 
years later, we reconnected and I asked her, so, you know, catch me up. So she caught me up and she told me about all the wonderful things she's doing at UCSF and, and professionally and the research that she's doing with regards to uh, the concept of diversifying the workforce and why that's so important. So given that I'm at San Jose State, we have this wonderful group of talent, which is the students that are here. We have this, the resources supporting the students, which is people like Vicky, people like Lily, and others, not just us. We have a whole group of others who are here to support you. I said, this is like a wonderful math problem. One plus one plus two plus three equals success. And so with that in mind, we, we, we thought about putting this, this situation together and these resources together and uh, and that's why we're here today. So I'm going to hand it back to whoever's next. And that's the context, okay? It was a very, very easy fit to put all these pieces together and, and let magic happen. All right, so I am done. Gracias, gracias Hugo. Uh, so before we jump into the actual uh, plática with Dr. Mendoza, I do want to just cover a couple of community agreements. Uh, with the first one, you know, of course, if we were a non-COVID world, we would be in person together having this plática. Um, and so I want to encourage us uh, to turn on your cameras if you can, just to see who's in the, in the house, uh, to see your lovely faces. Um, but again, it, only if you feel comfortable doing so, so that we feel we're actually together. Um, and also, you know, use the raised hand function. Uh, if you have a question throughout the plática, if something comes out, you know, go ahead and just uh, insert your, your questions into the chat box. We'll be managing those questions and we will be saving some time at the end to answer those questions. If you haven't already done so, please include your gender pronouns and next to your name in the video so that we know how to properly address you. And also engage with the, the chat function in other ways. So, you know, if you hear something that you're like, oh, I love what she just said, you know, go ahead and put that in the, in the chat box. Like that really resonates with me. Um, and we wanna, you know, use that chat fu function as an opportunity also in, to engage with one another. And if you do have your camera on, I encourage you to use nonverbal language. So again, if you feel really excited about something or Dr. Mendoza said a point that you're like, yes, you know, you could do your snaps or smile or like head nods. We want to, you know, feel that energia coming through the camera. And of course, I think most of you may have already accepted to record the session. We are going to be putting this up on our YouTube channel uh, to ensure that other students and community members have access to it since they weren't able to make it tonight. So if you don't feel comfortable mm -hmm. having your face shown or your name, you can change that up or um, disable your video so that we can make sure that we keep your information private. So we've started with our welcome. We're gonna move real quickly into introductions and then we wanna know who's in the room. So we're gonna engage you in a quick activity poll and then we will turn it over to uh, Dr. Vicky Gomez and Dr. Mendoza to start our plática and we will end with a Q&A so that we can have an opportunity for you to share, um, ask your questions or share any thoughts about today's plática. So I guess we're doing the poll right now. So let me go ahead and bring that up real quick. We want to know who is in the room. So give me a second while I do that. It lets me hear. Aquí está. Okay. All right. So if you can engage us in just a couple of minutes, let us know who's here. Are you a San Jose State student, staff member? Maybe you're one of our faculty members, an alum from San Jose State, or a community member. We're almost done here. Okay, thank you. So looks like the majority of our audience are San Jose State students. So yay, you made it. I know it's probably been a long week with classes and some, I'm, I'm sure some of you might already still be taking midterms, even though it's already three quarters of the way into the semester. I know uh, Dr. Gomez had already some papers already due this, this week. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I do see we have one of our faculty members and a community member, so welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Okay. So ahora, some more introductions. You got to meet Hugo, pero Hugo, tell us a little bit more about what you do at San Jose State. Hello, everybody. I am a, a primary uh, academic advisor, but I'm uh, trying to expand my role as a health professional advisor. I have ample experience in there, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm just looking to, uh, to share my uh, knowledge and experience with more and more students. So please uh, seek me out if you're, if you're at all interested in, in any of the health professions. 
Y buenas tardes. I'm Lily Pinedo Kianca. I serve as the program director of the Chicanx Latinx Student Success Center here on our campus. And I support our students in a variety of ways. And especially, it's been a really fun engaging with Ugo in this process as we think about creating a student organization focused on community health. So that's another way that we at the Centro help support our students, is especially our student organizations. We have probably over 400 student orgs on our campus. Uh, and there are maybe about 30 or so that are focused on Chicanx Latinx and next issues. Um, so we're here to offer that type of support as well through the center, um, in addition to a variety of other support services and events that we put on. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this afternoon, uh, Dr. Vicki Gomez, who's Assistant Professor in Public Health and Recreation here at San Jose State. And I'm just really excited, uh, Dr. Gomez, that you can join us. Dr. Gomez also had, when we were back at Centro on campus, uh, Dr. Gomez was always inside the Centro, uh, offering her support to our students, uh, not only the students that were in her classes, but offering her support and her mentorship to all the other students that would be coming into the Centro. So I just wanna thank you for your continued service um, in supporting our Latinx community, but all of our students at San Jose State. And so I'm really excited um, that you can join us today in this capacity to lead the conversation with Dr. Mendoza. So before I turn it over to Dr. Gomez, I do wanna share a little bit about Dr. Gomez's background. So mm -hmm. Dr. Vicky Gomez completed her Doctor of uh, Public Health degree from UC Berkeley School of Public Health in 2018. She was born and raised in San Francisco's Mission District, and she obtained her BS in Health Science and her BA in Raza Studies from San Francisco State University. She went on to obtain her Master of Public Health degree in Community Health Education from San Francisco State in 2009. For the last decade, Dr. Gomez has worked as a research coordinator and community-based participatory researcher on various cancer-related studies. Her commitment to addressing cancer disparities in the Latinx community served as the driving force to return to school for her doctorate degree and continue her research agenda as an assistant professor at San Jose State University in the Public Health and Recreation Department. Professor Gomez teaches PH 104, which is the Community Health Promotion course, to over 100 undergraduate students each semester. She's committed to teaching future public health practitioners to promote the health of marginalized communities with a cultural humility lens. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Vicky Gomez. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Lily. And are we going to have, is Google gonna still introduce Dr. Mendoza? Sure. Thank so, you. Thank you. So Dr. Rosalia Mendoza earned her bachelor's degree at the University of California, Berkeley, and a medical degree from the University of Washington. Go Huskies in Seattle. <laughs> And her <laughs> master's in public health at Harvard. Woo. She then completed her residency and fellowship at the University of California, uh, San Francisco, Department of Family and Community Medicine, before joining their faculty. Uh, Rosalia grew up in Coachella Valley, where health disparities and economic inequities informed her decision to enter health professions. Uh, she has worked at federally qualified health centers, also known as FQHCs, in the Bay Area as well as the larger health systems of Kaiser Sutter and Dignity Health. So just got a wealth of experience working for the, uh, the neediest, the ones that don't have insurance or are underinsured or maybe undocumented. And then she's also worked for uh, healthcare systems that are primarily health maintenance organizations like Kaiser, et cetera. Um, most recently, uh, Dr. Rosalia, Dr. Mendoza has uh, started a new, a new position at Stanford and uh, through the rest of our platica, she'll elaborate on that. But I don't want to spend any more time and keeping you from her. So let's proceed. Thank you so much, Ugo. I want to thank both Ugo and Lily for all of your hard work to make this uh, event a reality. Um, first, I also, I also want to thank Dr. Rosalia Mendoza for making the time to share her journey with us at San Jose State University. Um, I had the good fortune of talking to Dr. Mendoza last night, and we found out that we have traversed some of the same communities in the Bay Area and even had some of the same mentors. So I am really excited to moderate this plática and learn so much more about you, as is everybody in our audience. So the questions that I'm going to ask you today are a combination of questions developed directly from our students and our planning committee, and of course, our conversation last night. Um, so first, I wanna start with the question that we asked all of our students as we were planning for this event. What does community health mean to you? That's a great question, and th 
thanks again for everyone for coordinating this and taking time out of your busy um, days with you know studying and taking care of your families and staying safe during the pandemic there's so much more that we're juggling these days so I really appreciate the time that you're taking out of your uh, personal time maybe dinner uh, to be here and it really is an honor because when I think back to my own journey into healthcare, um, there are a couple of key seminal people that um, had a huge impact on decisions I made and my persistence to continue following graduate school into um, the healthcare um, industry and healthcare services as it relates to public health. Because without those key individuals and meeting them at the right time, um, I might have made other decisions. And so Ugo is one of those individuals and hopefully I can speak to more of what type of impact that he had. And for some of you that haven't had a chance yet to connect with him, um, he's got the same energy that I remember <laughs> um, back in the, the 90s um, as an undergrad. So it's really um, quite wonderful to be here. So community health, you know, is a very large kind of encompassing idea. And at, at its very tenets, I think it involves the general health of the community. And there's certainly many indicators that we can use to describe community health. Um, access to stable housing, access to food security and healthy foods. Um, general access to medical care and the ability to navigate it with confidence. Um, language access is a huge component of community health and the general kind of organization and infrastructure that supports um, um, both understanding when there are imbalances or health inequities, when there's a new problem that arises in the community, and being able to coordinate those resources that overlap between business, government, public health, um, and industry to best address those um, aspects. Because very often for community health, it's not just one person working in isolation, but it's a lot of people in coordination, hopefully with shared values, and um, at least some overlapping priorities. Because you can imagine in a community, be it San Jose, be it um, in the community of India where I grew up, or in San Francisco, you've got a lot of different communities, different pockets and demographic groups that have their own ideas, their own particular needs that, um, if not voiced, can um, not always echo the, the surrounding communities or the neighborhood that's just two blocks away. And so to that end, having a forum where people can discuss and prioritize what that community health looks like. Um, I think health equity is incredibly important as it pertains to both so social justice and understanding what are the needs of the community and how well are we doing in delivering those resources or solutions to those communities. Excellent, thank you so much. Dr. Yeah. Mendoza, um, I feel like you touched upon so much about the social determinants of health, which we talk about so much in community health promotion. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Um, when you think of what it means to diversify the health workforce, what does that vision look like for you? Um, I think it can, it, it entails a couple of different approaches and depending on who you ask or even me at a particular um, day, it's going to look very different. Um, there's Certainly, uh, when I think about the healthcare uh, system in the US, um, I think of a pyramid. Um, I think of a pyramid of the foundations of primary care and healthcare infrastructure as it pertains to community health centers, primary care health centers, and how those then relate to some of the subspecialties and acute care hospitals that come into play and support um, the health of, of this nation. Um, we can talk in some ways about um, diversity as it pertains to both uh, subspecialty. Do we have enough primary care physicians to provide general access, preventive care, and coordination for those that are more ill or more vulnerable into higher acute care um, services that they need? Um, do we have the appropriate diversification of cultural humility, cultural competency and language access for those communities where we may have monolingual individuals where English is not their primary language? Um, I can think also in the context of um, uh, 
um, diversity within our workforce do the um, racial representations that we know do translate to better health outcomes, better engagement by patients with um, their healthcare providers, match those of the communities that they're serving? Um, or if they're not ex the exact racial or ethnic um, breakdown, do you have individuals that carry that same type of cultural humility, cultural competency, and or language access to um, meet those needs and feel committed to those individuals? So I think diversity can take in um, a lot of different components. And in this pandemic, I think we're looking at a really critical place. Do we have enough um, emergency physicians? Do we have enough ICU intensivists? Do we have enough respiratory therapists um, that can deliver the critical COVID um, services when a patient requires hospitalization? And when, for instance, in San Francisco, when we were hit um, with the first two cases of COVID-19 in the city in the first week of March, if I can think back, it feels like a long time ago, but it also feels recent. Um, we were trying to think about what kind of surge um, surges of COVID patients that we were going to begin to see as we started to scale up our testing for COVID-19. Um, San Francisco is probably not surprisingly one of the um, most uh, dense um, cities after Manhattan in um, the US, and yet it's only seven miles by seven miles. Um, so when you're thinking about a high density of, uh, of people living together, small quarters, tight infrastructure and housing, um, many housing may be occupied by multi-generational families. One of the things that we were thinking about logistically, okay, first we have testing. Yes, do we have um, you know, the appropriate testing and screening protocols that we're going to require to identify those people that may be at risk or who um, may be symptomatic and a positive COVID-19. But once they're hospitalized, we were faced with some of the infrastructure questions. Do we have enough respiratory therapists to match the potential surge um, numbers that we were expecting at that time? And then thinking ahead into the winter period as we uh, embark upon the flu season, will we have enough respiratory therapists? Will we have enough ICU intensivists? Will we have enough hospitalists? Will we have enough nurses? And so you can imagine each of the ancillary service in healthcare because it's much very, very rich. Like when you think about some of the social posts that you may have seen in the last couple of um, months, certainly since the pandemic start, we hear a lot of call outs to physicians and nurses. Um, but the reality is, is the um, healthcare system is truly, truly um, much more diverse than that. We have nurses, we have healthcare outreach workers, we have nurses, we have administrators, we have pharmacists, speech therapists, each uh, physical therapist for people who've had perhaps a prolonged um, uh, ICU state. In each of those allied health fields are just as critical when you're talking about addressing a pandemic or if you're trying to meet the healthcare needs of a diverse population. So, um, you know, going back to your question as what does it entail? The healthcare workforce as a whole can be looked at in different ways. And right now we're looking through the lens of COVID, which is disproportionately affecting um, the Latinx community in ways that is just unprecedented. And um, I was looking up the numbers and approximately around 58 to 61 percent of all COVID cases in California are with, from our community um, and make up the greatest majority of COVID-19 deaths in California. So it really speaks to some of the both pre-existing health inequities that we had in our in um, our state and across the country, and also the most vulnerable populations. And I think of um, the Pacific Islander community in um, LA region, which have been disproportionately affected, the Native American communities in the, the Southwest. We're talking about communities where they don't have the resources to socially isolate, to continue to make money to feed their families. We're talking about individuals that may be living in multi-generational households where the idea of socially isolating in small quarters is very difficult to do. We're talking about communities that may have existing mistrust of messages or getting bombarded with mixed messages, both from the current administration and government and some of the local healthcare leaders that are trying to do outreach in their um, primary languages. 
Um, so, and then of course the access to healthcare, which you know continues to disproportionately affect um, communities of color. And I think there's, I'm forgetting the um, the speaker, but when he was describing, um, and it might be Dr. Sachs, but he said that when you look at diseases, they fall across the health inequity fault lines of the country. So whether we're talking about tuberculosis whether we're talking about HIV, whether we're talking about um, on diabetes, or if we're talking about COVID-19, these diseases are following the fault lines of the health inequities within our society. Um, so it's certainly one that's on the forefront of our minds. And as you can see, both with this current election and also um, some of the budgets and reallocation of resources, maybe in some of the communities or organizations that you're working for or volunteering, people are moving their resources to try and most quickly address these issues. So it's kind of taken some of our initial workforce diversity questions that we might have had a year ago, six months ago, and now having to realign those needs very quickly. In San Francisco, um, we've had, um, there's the Latinx um, task force in San Francisco that has been very vocal about coordinating both with the Department of Public Health as well as UCSF, the local academic um, institution. And the reason for that is they felt that the, some of the resources and testing were not um, best aligned with the needs and concerns of the community as the pandemic started to um, to rage in the, in the community. And as the numbers and tallies were being released, and once the Department of Public Health actually broke down the case rates and death rates by race and ethnicity, that's when I think the community became even more aware of how disproportionately it was affecting the Latinx community. And so when I think about the mobilization that occurs in San Francisco and some of the alignment, it's been really wonderful to see that type of coordination in ways and um, innovation that's kind of been forced and creatively um, grown out of the pandemic that we weren't having that level of coordination before. But the, um, I would say the crisis and the needs in front of us really demand that level of change. Thank you so much um, for sharing that vision with us and for really putting into context um, what so many of us, you know, have been thinking about um, with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, kind of um, speaking a little bit to what you were talking about is how can we help to increase Latinx representation in the field? Like you talked about yeah. this vision of having a, a diverse kind of like force um, in the clinical you know, world. Um, yeah. What does that look like? Well, you know, it kind of takes me back to um, this an amazing, when we talk about certain experiences that we have growing up, I want to share one with all of you that I had. There was a, a program called FLAMA, Future Leaders of America, which has been um, renamed down in Southern California that would take um, middle school students um, into, I think it was Big Bear camp for about a week or a weekend. And I don't remember everything that occurred that, that week, but one of the talks from one of the speakers was just so empowering. It kind of seared in my mind as an eighth grader getting ready to go to high school at Indio High School in the Coachella Valley. And he was describing at that time, this was 1980. Nine. Okay, I had to think back. 1989. But what he projected was right now the demographics, he was talking 1989, um, do not currently reflect the people in power and the people making decisions for our communities. And he looked at all of us and he put his finger and he pointed around the room and there was, oh, easily at least 50 students there. And he said, I need you to be the teachers the educators, the lawyers, the doctors um, of the future so that when the demographics pick up and start to match and represent um, the majority, which will occur in a couple decades, we will have the people in the community um, positions of leadership, um, budget allocation, um, advocacy, and partnership that will really speak for our communities. And that was when I felt charged. And that's when he looked at all of us and said, this is what I'm asking of you. And so, you know, as a, as a um, you know, recent teenager, you know, you just don't think about the future in really that context. And yet when someone kind of paints this incredible need for our community and paints how 
he believes that each or one of us can make a difference in that I've, I was kind of placed with this purpose. I was placed both with his vision, but how it, can I actually reflect that in my role? So kind of going into high school, going through, you know, growing up in, in, in the desert where I grew up, that was always percolating in my mind. How do you kind of translate service and how do you translate, um, you know, the experiences and the situations um, and the systems that you grow up in, how is that going to transform you? And in the desert where I grew up, um, there was huge polarizations between both sides of the valley, between a very wealthy retirement community um, that was predominantly Caucasian at that time and a kind of working class blue collar and a good portion of people in the other side of the valley that were immigrants, first and second generation immigrants in the valley that were working blue collar um, positions or working in the fields. And so those aspects of um, disproportional um, well, one, the splitting of the demographics, but also the kind of socioeconomic and political um, decisions and even within business that were made in the desert had huge impacts. I mean, now everyone thinks about, you know, Coachella, the, the festival, but back then we didn't have the festival. Um, back then, um, there were a lot of casinos that hadn't opened up at that time, and it was a very different economic situation. And yet, I think those um, inequities in both healthcare and economic um, inequity has left a very left a very lasting impression on me, and a sense that there are um, definitely issues that we can play, or things that we want to contribute to on a larger basis. So, to your question of how do we diversify the workforce, I, I mention this for a big reason. Having a sense for each of you that are here tonight. There are probably seminal events, experiences, or things that you've read or seen that have left lasting impressions on you that make you think in a different way or motivate you to um, you know, create and give back or make a difference in this world. And I think those experiences are really important. And sometimes we need to sit down and talk with someone or write it down on a piece of paper. Some of the first conversations that I had when I met Ugo as an undergrad were kind of walking through some of these experiences and trying to understand who are you and what, what does this mean to you? And why are you thinking about medicine? And for you, that may be in the context of nutritional sciences, or it may be in the context of medicine, or it may be in the context of public health. Why are you drawn to that? Perhaps it's someone you met. Perhaps it's um, you know someone that you knew growing up that um, maybe your uh, community doctor that had an impact on you, or you had an accident and you worked with a physical therapist that was just transformative for you or for a loved one. These experiences make a difference. And I think when we can put them down on paper, it creates vision and purpose. So that's kind of where I frame the starting point of who you are all the experiences that you've gone through up until this point at San Jose um, State University. The second one, I think, um, really comes to uh, kind of the, the mentorship and networking, which is what we're doing tonight, right? Many of these people you may have worked with, volunteered with, or um, had platicas or one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship um, conversations. These are the type of relationships and support systems that I think really help to us help us to expand and think about other possibilities. In my case as an undergrad, similar to where you guys are, it was about the idea of, well, you have this vision of going into medicine, but how are you going to get there? Do you know the steps of getting and applying to medical school? Do you know that there is a board exam that you have or uh, an entrance exam that you have to take called the MCAT? Um, do you know how much that costs? <laughs> um, these were some of the logistical things. And the, the, the more important one is, do you know what you're getting into? Do you know what this field can prizes? Do you know what is asked of a person and the type of work or ideas or challenges that they're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis? Is that for you? Is that in alignment with your values? Or are there other possibilities that you might be interested in? So I think that the second piece that I would highlight for everyone tonight is the mentorship and networking that will help challenge and expose you to new opportunities. Um, very often when you talk about people who do healthcare workforce, we talk about pipelines. And it's at each of these points, whether we're talking about um, K, 
K through 12 um, education, or even before that, the first three, um, three to five years of development, each of these steps are kind of gateways that help to determine outcomes for our success. And the, the means by which we go through to get through, let's say the um, pre-K, kind of the three to five years of development, learning, reading, talking, speaking, um, our functional disability, that's our functional ability, that's one um, really important step. K through 12 education, there's many steps along that way that some of us may have stumbled or could have fallen, or some of us just continue to excel. Those are a critical point. So getting into college in this far and making that choice is an incredible gateway that you've already passed through. The second one is um, perhaps into vocational training, graduate school, um, um, to continue your um, education and training. And that's a critical gateway. If we don't understand that pipeline and how these connect, you can imagine there's various places that can be um, um, challenging. If we don't have the right support systems, if we're not aware of each of the steps of criteria and eligibility that we need to meet to move forward, adelante, right? Those are the critical things that, um, at least for me, when I came to Berkeley, I was not familiar. I didn't have anyone in my family that was from the health field. And so I was asking a lot of questions. And sometimes I wasn't asking the questions, but I had individuals like Uamora who were saying, hey, you, should, you know, you should be thinking about this. You know, do you realize that there's um, a date that's coming up and have you um, taken the steps to start drafting your personal statement? For me at Berkeley, I kind of had three key mentors that were pretty critical. Hugo was one of those and helped connect me with the Chicanos in Health Education Che at um, UC Berkeley. The other person was um, that I kind of connected through through the Career Center at my campus was through the Alumni Mentorship Program. And I connected with a physician about midway through my undergrad um, by the name of um, Dr. Tomas Aragon. And he was an epidemiologist in public health. And um, he was someone who had also gone on to medical school but made public health his profession. He's, the ironic thing is he's now the health, um, health officer for San Francisco um, and has helped move our city through the most incredible um, time in this during this pandemic with really science-based thoughtful health orders um, that are run by the mayor and other key health um, and industry and community leaders and so he was an incredible sounding board and checkpoint when I was making decisions about class selection when do I take this course when should I start studying for the MCAT um, should I be cutting back on my hours of employment because I'm actually devoting so many hours in a work week towards working and it's taking time away from my studies. And so maybe I should start looking at a different balance. He was someone that really pushed that idea and challenged me to think, well, maybe you should find a different job that pays more so you can work more, less hours and actually devote more time to your studies or extracurricular activities. Um, and the third person was um, Dr. Abby Rincon, who was in um, the public health department at UC Berkeley and I was connected with her through um, a public health internship where we um, were, um, in my case, was um, a sex health educator um, that was a year-long commitment and was just so rich in its foundation of public health um, ideas and um, structures and kind of the historical development of public health and a community project that we could actually apply these ideas. And those three people through different points of my undergrad experience really made that support. So mentorship, networking, and pipeline, I think is a critical piece. The third one is risk-taking um, because in, you know, when I think back to certain um, steps, places where our, our lives kind of bifurc um, bifurcated, could have gone in this direction or that direction. Um, part of it is risk taking. You have a certain set of goals that you may have set for yourself. And the next place is really putting yourself out there, um, realizing that there's certain experiences that maybe you've never had before or um, that make you um, partly uncomfortable. And one of those examples that I'll probably, I'll, um, that comes to mind um, quickly is the experience of um, the first kind of um, 
community um, health screening that I took part in with the Mission Neighborhood Health Center in San Francisco. And as a partnership between the UC Berkeley CHE group, we were serving as student volunteers and they were doing blood pressure um, screenings and diabetic screenings and mammography um, screenings and referrals for um, screening um, studies um, in the mission. And I was very uncomfortable. I wasn't used to being a person that could give advice or to direct someone from one room to the next or to be so close to someone that I'd never been with before and take their blood pressure because I've never used a blood pressure machine, you know, a manual one with a stethoscope and what am I listening for? So that experience really put me out of my comfort zone, both in um, communicating and trying to be a health advocate, trying to educate in um, key areas of blood pressure and the importance of engaging with primary care and in a personal space using tools I've never used before. And I know it sounds simple and maybe many of you have taken part in something like this, but that risk, that type of experience, I think um, is an example of risk taking. Another one would be um, when I was asked to do public speaking during a summer internship that I had at the University of Washington that I did as an undergrad. It was a paid internship and I wouldn't even considered a summer internship between coursework. Many of us have had to make decisions about working and I certainly did several summers where I was working to save up and pay for my living expenses um, while being in college. Um, but I did take one uh, particular summer off to do this paid internship and part of that experience was doing public speaking on a topic of um, uh, sexually transmitted um, disease screening and the relationship between HPV and um, uh, cervical cancer. And again, it was a large room full of 80 or 100 people and I just had to practice. Um, I did several dry runs and had to kind of work with that level of um, discomfort of public speaking and hear my voice out loud being projected to the auditorium and trying to deliver information that was important and salient to the audience. So some of these risk-taking experiences I think really shape us and they challenge us and we rise to the occasion and then we're looking for other opportunities. And so I think the risk-taking and new experiences sometimes even outside our own communities are really critical. Goal setting. Um, I have a friend, um, Jesus Reina, who I met during a research training program um, back in 1998. And he is now working in some of the public health emergency response in Eastern Washington. And he had a tip that I wanted to share with you as it pertains to goal setting. And I, I know these are kind of individualistic um, ideas that I'm sharing with all of you, but I'm, I, I'm sharing it because these are some of the things that I wish I had done or done earlier that I didn't hear about. And what he did is he had certain short-term goals and he had long-term goals that he had set for himself or ones that he had helped um, draft, um, you know, with his mentors. And he placed those post-its on his mirror so that every time he had to brush his teeth or he went into the bathroom, he's seeing those reminders of those goals. And anytime he was faced with a really tough decision, um, he was at that time um, going uh, into a, a nursing program into graduate school and was also kind of entertaining what were the opportunities out of nursing school that he was going to pursue. And anytime he was faced with like a financial, personal or professional decision, he could look at those post-it notes and reflect, are these still in alignment with the goals that I set for myself? Is that in alignment and I need to kind of put this decision or this opportunity to the side? Or is it an opportunity to reevaluate the goals that he had set and realign those goals and maybe take a path that he wasn't used to? So I think goal setting for all of us, and that can be with the help of friends, colleagues, um, other students who are in the same uh, professional development trajectory that you are, we support each other. And, you know, we have those reminders, hey, did you hear about this opportunity? I was down at the Career Center, or I heard about this during our public health course. Did you hear about this um, volunteer opportunity? And so I think those things are really critical, both the support and the other one is the goal setting, as, and as I mentioned earlier, the risk taking. And self-care, um, I think this is maybe a really timely idea to share with all of you because 
Um, certainly, I think each of us have been uh, profoundly changed by the pandemic and are doing things so much differently than we did back in March or February of this year. So I'm reminded of this because I've had so many um, kind of deep conversations with other colleagues and friends and family about what we do for self-care. And for me, I've had to kind of reevaluate what that means. When I think back to where each of you are at as an undergrad, um, you know, the, the basic framework at that time that I had was exercise. And I didn't really have a good sense or application of that. I think social media has definitely promoted self-care, but um, many of the key components of um, self-care and well-being are those that are going to translate to your success. Because if we are grounded, if we are clear headed in what we're approaching in any of the challenges that we face with another person, work or personal, we can still navigate these situations that much more difficult. And so for me, when I reflect back to what that means, that it does involve exercise and I wasn't doing so much exercise um, March, April and May um, because I was working 12 to 17 hour days, um, six days a week. And I was just trying to reflect in every moment that I wasn't working um, in the hospital, I was trying to research up on COVID-19 and what someone else in Seattle is doing. What is a colleague in uh, Colorado doing? How are we addressing this in Southern California and trying to pool resources? But when I had a moment to stop, and we could take a breath, the case rates were coming down, I recognized that I wasn't exercising like I was before. So um, that involved for me restarting, for me, yoga practice um, and doing it virtually because I'm not always good to motivate myself. Um, and then in the last couple months, it's meant um, starting to run again. Even when the light is escaping us, I'll find a safe place to go running after a long day and still force myself and mot or motivate uh, myself to, to go running. Um, other aspects that I would have wanted to think about as an undergrad is debt and decisions around debt because our financial well-being sometimes are very tied to uh, the decisions that we make personally and professionally. And I wasn't thinking as critically about debt management, um, you know, as it pertained to credit card as an undergrad that I wish I had made greater decisions um, or been thinking about more critically. So, and I'm happy to talk to any of you about what that means. Um, I don't wanna go into it too, too deeply because I feel like there's so many other topics. Um, humility. A lot of times we come in with our own kind of unconscious bias, our own experiences, and they may be very passionate and well-intentioned ideas. And we're working with or trying to partner or we're meeting someone for the first time. And how um, with humility and receptivity, can we hear different ideas from another person who may have had a very different experience? And I think in healthcare, which is one of the most beautiful things we meet so many other people, our colleagues, but certainly our patients that come from experiences that we're not used to. So, you know, trying to find compassion and find um, ability to place ourselves in the other person's foot, I think gives us an ability to empathize with the other person and to be supportive perhaps during a really critical time. Um, and that's something that I had to learn over time. And you know, on the flip side of humility, I think a lot of us do come from a place of wanting to make a difference, empathy, and trying to strive for equity in our communities. Um, but the other one is, you know, also advocating for ourselves. We may hear the answer no, or we may not be invited to the table or told about a particular opportunity. So the other one is, how do we hustle? And for me, and I'm sure maybe at San Jose State, one of the things I learned as an undergrad is the idea of resourcefulness. And even when you fail or you make a mistake, you get yourself back up again and you keep pushing. Because that is, I think, one of the essence of people are like, how did you make it to medical school? And I'm like, well, I was stubborn. <laughs> uh, I was stubborn and I didn't give up. I persevered. And I think that's one of the things that we often forget about. We hear about the successes, but we don't always hear about some of the more challenging times or some of the um, lessons learned. I always think of the statement, um, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. 
And so that really means that a lot of our journey is about learning and challenging ourselves differently. And the other one is resiliency. And that's something that I've really picked up in the last year. And certainly since the pandemic, which I think has taken on a, a more um, urgent need because all those things maybe you guys are doing it you're eating healthy you're exercising you're socializing with friends all those things but the pandemic i think has really challenged us to um, do like these virtual connections and how do we um, self-soothe and um, care for ourselves during a really volatile political climate um, a very uncertain um, you know financial times and one where our health and the health of our loved ones and our community are sometimes unclear or concerning so the idea of mindfulness and intention are one of the ones that I am actively using on a day-to-day -day basis that helps me in difficult um, uh, I would say meetings or um, difficult uh, interactions with family or friends when we're having these discussions about social distancing and masking and no, I'm not coming over for Thanksgiving this year because we can't guarantee a safe interaction. You know, these can be hard conversations to navigate. And so each of these tools that I'm kind of sharing with you are not merely not ones that I've mastered necessarily, but I'm sharing with you are things that I think are really critical in our success as we move forward into the health diversity. And then the last one is kind of inclusion and equity policies. You know, are the values of the institution that you're a part of, be it San Jose um, State University or the uh, employer that you're working for, are these shared values for diversity, equity, and inclusion at the institution that you're volunteering from, that you're doing your graduate studies, or that you're working from? And I think as we make our way into um, these positions of leadership, com um, committees, or advocacy, I think we have the opportunity to shape and to help um, change some of the policies that will affect future generations um, behind us and even in the groups that we're working with um, currently. So um, I th there are many pronged ideas, but pipeline and networking is critical. And if you have only one mentor right now, this might be a time that I would say, you know, look for one or two others, people that maybe you hadn't thought of approaching, even if they don't look like you or don't speak the same language. Um, I've been often surprised in my career, especially as I left the undergrad period, the individuals who have kind of um, went out of their way to look out for my career and per personal and professional development have not always been people of color. I shared with you the three seminal people that made a difference for me as an undergrad. It was Uga Mora, it was um, Tomas Aragon, and Abby Rincon. But as I moved higher into, you know, graduate school and postgraduate work and fellowship and faculty and then into the private industry of healthcare, um, there were fewer of us at the table. And so learning to understand that there are people who are allies and advocates and people that just love and are natural mentors. Um, me feeling comfortable that, yes, these are individuals that are going to make a difference for me. And I think of uh, a particular um, physician is Dr. Kevin Grumbach, who is the chair for the Department of Family and Community Medicine. And I happen, um, a friend of mine um, who was also in CHE, um, who's now at the Mayo Clinic, um, I believe up in um, Minnesota, um, doc, uh, Dr. Joaquin um, Garcia, he had given me some books to read prior to going to my interviews for medical school. And two of these books were around the U.S. healthcare system and the re um, transformation for healthcare. One of the authors was Tom Bodenheimer, and the other one was Kevin Grumbach. They have these really long names. And um, so I read them. And um, years later, after I had gone to medical school, I was interviewing for my residency programs in family medicine and OBGYN. I hadn't made my decision um, in which field to train. And when I got to the UCSF Department of Family and Community Medicine to interview, I happened to look at the binder and see some of the um, faculty members that were doing research. And I saw Kevin's name. Kevin Grumbach. And I was like, 
wait a minute, he's here on faculty? <laughs> um, and he is based here at the county hospital that provides, you know, tertiary care, um, safety net services for one of the most diverse communities in an urban setting here in the Bay Area. And they're like, yes. And interestingly enough, over the course of um, eight years, he went on to become my mentor and he was a private, um, you know, um, a principal investigator for many of the research studies that I went on to take part in for both healthcare workforce and um, directed me into oral health disparities as it pertains to communities of color in California. And that was through his guidance, through his vision, and through his commitment um, to kind of transforming my, my path. So I would just really encourage everyone that um, if you've got one mentor or maybe two on your list, now's a good time to start thinking and hitting up other people to see how they can add a different view, different perspective and get to know you and understand what are the things that are important to you and where you think you would like to go next. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendoza. I just want to um, tell everyone in the audience that this would be a good time if you guys have questions. Um, you answered a lot of the questions that were on my list without me having to ask, so thank you. Um, you did touch a little bit about um, you know, you, your journey, which was great, and obviously our journeys are not often linear. There are many curves and stops along the way. I know that's been the case for me. Um, mm -hmm. What challenges or barriers did you encounter on your journey? Um, there were a number of them. <laughs> uh, I would say the first one is myself. And that was um, a place as an undergrad that I think Ugo really pushed. And he's like, you know, why are you doubting yourself? Why are you saying that that's not possible without looking at the options and then going for it? So I think for me, one of the first um, challenges was really trying to kind of reconcile some of the, um, you know, concerns or fears of risk or failure that I was placing in front of myself um, without trying to take those opportunities first. And it's like, no, you can do this. You set a goal, you set a plan, and you go for it. Until someone tells you no two or three times, that's when you know it's over. Um, so I, I think the, the first one was myself. The second one was being at a large um, undergrad campus and you know hearing about the size of San Jose State University. It's a large campus. There's a lot of students that are also hustling and um, you know that you're sitting alongside are now on virtual um, learning platforms. And um, really understanding that you know we're we're not always going to have the best exam let's say on that first midterm and what does that failure or that low performance mean for you are you going to then reflect look at how you did something and say okay i want to pivot i want to change what i'm doing and how does kind of failure or experimentation inform how you move forward and that's the element of reflection growth and resiliency that I think we sometimes learn um, and not letting that mentality or that thinking distract you from where you're headed. And we're going to have challenges. We're not always gonna get the best grade on that first midterm. The question is, how do you adjust your approach to learning? As uh, an undergrad, I didn't quite understand how I learned when I came out of high school, from Indio High School, um, realizing that you know, there are many other students at the table who had gone to private schools, that had had tutors, that had had so many other resources. I had to very quickly understand, you know, how do I learn as a student learner? I'm a visual person. I'm an audio person. So for me, that meant learning. I had to take notes. I had to kind of create cheat sheets and visual representation of relationships for ideas or concepts. Um, as it pertained for some of the science courses. It meant that I learned through talking and getting instruction from others. So if I couldn't get everything I needed in the undergrad lecture hall, I was gonna go to the TA um, office hours, which was really hard at first, you know, again, get, um, gearing myself up for that approach. And it would also mean going to some of the um, kind of uh, study groups and setting them up with other peers who perhaps had other strengths and I could bring my strengths and we could learn and support one another. Um, you know, the, um, 
the the financial um, barriers uh, I think are real. You know, the first year of my undergrad, I lost. I had come in with certain grants and scholarships, and then the budget kind of collapsed in around '93. And very quickly, I had to kind of re reassess how I was going to pay for tuition and housing, which was really quite stressful. And what that meant is that um, I was working. Um, I I had worked all throughout high school and had taken the first year of undergrad off. And then because of the loss of grants, I had to start working um, that summer between first and second year of undergrad. And I continued working until I graduated. Of course, not a lot of students are having to do that by virtue of survival. I wasn't just doing it for enrichment purposes, but it was one of survival and necessity. So um, I think it taught me uh, certainly the appreciation of and learning to become better at time management because at first I wasn't as good about that. Um, certainly preparing and studying for courses as a high school student and um, college, um, you know, they require different commitments and um, structure. Um, to be honest, I didn't work in medical school, but when I went to grad school back east at Harvard for my master's, I was working. I was doing work study, even as a graduate student. And um, I think it just gives a certain level of appreciation. I kind of joked to myself with these two, um, these one year as an undergrad and um, three years as a medical student where it was kind of, you were working in the clinic. Um, I've been working since I was 15. <laughs> um, uh, which is really kind of impressive when you take a step back, but I think it gives you a sense of, you know, the type of discipline that a lot of us have understood, you know, um, I'm Mexican, I hustle, and I, I don't take, take anything for granted, um, because I know that circumstances, like losing that grant that I had counted on for my tuition, I lost. Um, I should be looking at these um, comment sections too, because I realize people are. No, I'm going to start asking. Questions. I'm going to start asking you them, so you don't okay. have to pay attention to them. So, okay. so. no worries. So I think the other ones um, in terms of um, barriers to success is just um, really tr again taking risks, putting yourself out there. Um, you know. I had come into medical school thinking, you know, primary care and um, realized that there were a lot of opportunities in med school. And so I started volunteering and taking part in interest groups that kind of took me outside my comfort level. We worked with a homeless clinic um, that was serving a really high needs area in downtown Seattle, um, where I became the kind of dermatology coordinator. I wasn't delivering the services at the time, but I realized very quickly to, that during that experience that I had organizational skills and I could really help and problem solve in um, key moments that um, left a really important uh, um, kind of moment of reflection that yes, these experiences kind of contest and confirm some of the things that we like to do and the things that maybe are our strengths or um, skill sets that we didn't realize we um, had before. And the last one I would say apart from you know, access to opportunities and having to hustle and go out of your way to hear about them. And you'll find out through mentors and through networking, if you put yourself out there, is mental health. And uh, I think the first time when I was really mindful of kind of that self-care uh, moment was in med school when um, the volume of learning that we were having during our second year, the grind of having exams every, I think it was every Monday, um, that's what it was in our second year was a grind and all of us kind of looking at each other and thinking, how are we going to get through this year? Cause this is, this is just like the first month and we have how many more months and then we have to do, um, our board exam. So for, for that, I lived in a house, um, with other roommates, other, um, Chicanas that were from California, different levels. So I could have that experience of knowing what's that second year, that third year, that fourth year going to look like in med school, but other people who had been through the same experiences that I could rely on. And, you know, our outlets ended up being running in the rain, which I, as a Californian, you know, if it rained, we took our recess inside, you know, the soccer games were canceled. 
in Seattle, that didn't happen. And so learning to run in the rain, because that made the difference of me being able to sleep better and to focus and sit down and kind of approach the work that came in front of me. Um, and outlets of having dinners together and going dancing on weekends when there was opportunity to do so. These were critical things that created community, created familiarity and release during an incredibly um, stressful time in at least my professional um, period. And I think for a lot of med students that you speak to, we each kind of face that question and have to find what's gonna be the best way to uh, um, deal with those challenges. Sometimes they're, um, they're healthy responses, sometimes they're not. And you have to kind of do trial and error to figure out what works. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendoza. So a couple of questions that we have, um, and I want to apologize if we don't get to everybody's question, but I'm going to try and do my best to yeah. compile them together. Um, we have two questions, one from uh, Vanessa and one from Eric around mentorship. So yeah. they want to know, how can I find a mentor? Um, mm -hmm. Ask someone to be my mentor. What are some of the ways I can make myself stand out being online and a first year um, and a first year? And then Vanessa asks, what are things that you did to stay connected with your mentors? Yeah, so, or what did they do to stay connected with me? Because it's a bi <laughs> bi-directional relationship. Um, you know, the, the first one is understanding at San Jose State, what are the resources for mentorship? And you obviously, with this group, have some incredibly experienced um, people such as yourself, such as Lily and um, Uwa Mora, who, if they don't have the answers for you, they're going to find the people in your surrounding community that can be a great resource. And so that's the key point. If you haven't sat down or met with them, um, don't hesitate to do so because you're really coming in for at least the those three individuals, um, Dr. Gomez, Uo, and Lily, they have they've been doing this for a while and they know the people to kind of best align and hearing what your thoughts are. The second one is um, understanding where those mentorship um, other possibilities lie. And one of the things that I kind of quickly looked onto is the, um, I looked on the website, the San Jose State University and it had the mentoring hub. And so, you know, can you kind of connect yourself with um, a, a mentor on campus already? Um, the two others that come to mind, you have Stanford University Medical School, and I'm talking to those of you that may be pre-health, um, pre-med, um, UCSF, um, and I'd be happy to kind of compile these resources and web links, and, and we can distribute these out afterwards, so you can kind of take a look at them and see if these are opportunities that you would like to link up with. Um, there are some um, upcoming events, like the UCSF, um, has like an admissions um, workshop in March for next year. They actually, how to apply to medical school, um, UCSF has an online event November 12th um, of this year that's upcoming. Um, there was a postback um, application that's due for those that maybe are not ready to apply to medical school, but want a little bit more academic enrichment prior to applying and taking the boards. And that's coming up on November 18th. Um, I participated in a you might have heard of it, the AAMC, the American Academy of uh, Medical Colleges, had summer in enrichment internships, paid internships that helped us connect with mentors, get onto campuses and connect with other physicians that um, were helping us as we were getting ready to apply. That name has changed, but they still take applicants every year. And I would love to be able to share that opportunity with you because it's specifically targeted for undergrads who are pre-med, pre-health. Um, and then it's, you know, maybe setting up a time with Ugo, Vicky, Lily, or myself, and I'm happy to take and connect with any of you offline. So maybe we can go into more depth and kind of hear more of your story and what you need. If I can't provide those links or mentorships, I can tell you between the four of us, we will find those connections in the community. And what's beautiful about this being the pandemic and virtual, it means that we can connect with people in Southern California, Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, um, if we need to. And um, it's kind of removed some of those barriers because n n we're not as, um, you know, turned off by meeting people virtually, uh, which is even I'm getting used to this whole Zoom experience and seeing my face up on a screen. Um, and how do you stand out? I think one of the things that Ugo had asked me to do is to kind of sit down and think about where did you come from? What's important to you? And what are you thinking about? You know, maybe the ideas of, you know, graduate school or employment 
are ideas you have, and these are valid in the moment, and they're stepping points to help you and the mentor decide what are those possibilities and what are things that you haven't thought of that you'd like to. And in the past, it would be one of us sitting down, finding a time to meet with you in a cafe. Now we're going to do it on Zoom. <laughs> and maybe we're going to do it in the evening time before or after work uh, or before your studying period. But it's really an idea to share kind of who you are, where you come from, and some of the ideas that you have. You know, maybe you're thinking about um, nursing school. Maybe you're thinking about medical school and you want to know what should I be thinking about? Maybe that's the first question. Or maybe you have been thinking about this and chipping away at the steps to apply to graduate school, but you want to know if you're on track. And you want one extra set of eyes to take a look at what you're doing, be it um, uh, class selection, um, application timing, um, um, you know, selecting schools that you want to apply to into or out of California. Sometimes that's a really big question. When is the right time to apply? Do I do it this year? Do I wait till next year when we might have a, uh, we'll probably, we will have a vaccine on hand for some select portions of the population. These are questions that at least can be a starting point. And then it's a platica. And then it's a relationship we might not get to every question that you have, but at least if you come with one or two and a little bit about your background, that's gonna break the ice and then we can go from there. Thank you so much. Um, two um, questions from two different people, but along the similar vein. Um, Salvador mm -hmm. wants to know what has been one of your most valuable experiences throughout your journey. And Marilyn wants to know what made you pursue uh, an, an MPH degree? Okay, great questions. Um, so, Salvador, uh, there are so many, um, so many critical experiences, um, and I, I'm actually going to jump to one um, and try and tie it in. Healthcare is so diverse. You heard me speak about it uh, earlier in the first part of the hour. You know, speech therapy, um, promadores, um, nurses, physicians, um, physical therapists, administrators, epidemiologists, public health. Healthcare is an opportunity to so many choices. And my career path was not linear. I started with thinking I was going into primary care. I took a detour with public health, then went into research, then went into um, academia then went to industry, came back to primary care, and now am more involved in healthcare administration at the hospital level. There was no way I could have predicted any of these um, experiences. But what I wanna to share to all of you is that you will always have employment with healthcare. It is an incredibly rich and diverse um, profession. And I incorporate public health now more than ever because of its integral piece in responding to the pandemic crisis. And we're very lucky, all of us, to live in the counties of Santa Clara and San Francisco because we have incredibly gifted and um, science-driven um, public health specialists. So I say that starting off to say that healthcare in ways that I had no idea have opened opportunities for me that I didn't think possible. When I was a fourth year in residency in family medicine, um, I had the opportunity to do an elective. And at the time, I was very interested in infectious disease. And so I chose to um, connect with uh, my, my six-week elective in Africa. And UCSF had a very strong relationship and still does with Uganda, um, which is a former British colony in Africa. There were some UCSF established programs, but I actually ended up going with a faith-based um, uh, non-government uh, non organization, NGO, that was providing HIV, pediatric HIV care to a community in Kampala, which is the county or the capital of Uganda. And um, I really didn't have any contacts. I was doing everything really through word of mouth and um, recommendation, but when I was there, there, and I had already completed at that point, um, Salvador, three, three years of family medicine training in, around preventive care, obstetric, pediatric, um, and acute care hospital training, as well as um, kind of exposure into um, participatory community um, projects. Um, 
at that time when I went, I had also done my master's in public health when I took time off between medical schools. So I had that public health community-based um, training. When I was in Africa, there were so many experiences that ended up asking me to pull from one of those toolboxes. And it was kind of in an outside country, in a foreign uh, you know, setting, that I really appreciated how far I had come. So I had met through a mutual friend, a gentleman who was working um, through the CDC that was providing um, PEPFAR, uh, Preventive Emergency. Um, it was actually funded by, um, surprisingly, George W. Bush and Colin Powell, um, preventive free um, antiretrovirals for mothers and children who had been exposed um, to HIV, either in utero. Um, and this gentleman was developing an outreach program to the prenatal program in this community on the border of Kenya. And so he's like, I have this grant, and would you will be willing to take a look at it? So I kind of pulled out my tool sets of helping with grant writing and understanding some of the epidemiology and public health reach programs and program development. And I was able to bring uh, experience to the table. Every day that I went to the clinic, I was pulling from my family medicine, obstetric and pediatric, and kind of mental health training that I had had in from residency to work with incredibly um, wonderful young children. Many of them were orphaned at this point in their um, experience with living with HIV because they had lost their father and then they had lost their mother and were now living in certain communities. And to get to this clinic, many of them might have taken a whole day's ride on a bus to come for their um, you know, three month check to get their medications, get their lab work, get screened for malaria, et cetera. And, trying to pull all of those skill sets was incredible. Um, then um, I, another friend was working for um, a, a University of Texas sponsored program um, that was collaborating um, with um, doing outreach and delivery of antiretrovirals on motorbikes to communities in very rural parts of the area. And so they were kind of giving me a tour of the community. And we had a couple individuals that when they heard that I was a doctor, even though they knew that I was kind of being shown around to understand about this HIV project of delivering antiretrovirals, this gentleman had questions about a cough. This individual had questions about a rash that they were experiencing. And so kind of in this ra random context, I was um, being asked to kind of switch hats and put on a different resource. Um, and then we had another person during, I was on a rafting trip on the Nile, which is where the Nile originates, um, right where Uganda was, who syncopized. And all of a sudden I was kind of putting on a different um, question of um, you know, triaging this person in the middle of um, a busy um, setting. So all of that to say is that I hadn't reflected on the ways that I could help and the ways that I could make a difference until I was in that um, international experience. And I kind of reflected to say, wow, what are these are the skill sets that I can bring. And of all of these things that I'm using during this trip, what are the ones that ring true? What are the um, things that I really want to devote myself to in a very focused manner after I graduate from residency? But to do that in a foreign country where people are turning to you with so much trust and understanding and hope to, to, to ask that you can make a difference was just um, really, um, humi there was a lot of humility in that experience. So um, I guess there's certain things that we take for granted and it's not until we're in these situations that we have a moment to kind of reflect and pause and realize, okay, how far have we've come and where are we gonna go next? And for me, that was an experience that took place in Uganda on the African continent. Um, the other question about the MPH, in part because I had taken an introductory course of master's in public health um, as a second year, it was this incredible presentation um, where we had different speakers with each course and got to hear how certain kind of either community infectious disease or other public health needs kind of have shaped the development of our public health system in um, the U.S. and how it can be instrumental in addressing both either national or local health care needs that I realized I love 
the large scope system based and community focused approach to public health. I understand because at that time I had said to myself, I want to be a physician. I can make a difference one on one with the patient that comes through the door or the family of individuals that I take care of. In part, that's why family medicine was such a, a drive for me, unlike other specialties, is that I didn't have to look at the, just one individual. I was seeing that person in the context in their relationship to other family members that I was probably also directly or indirectly um, pr um, providing service and health care for. But public health was different. Public health had a very kind of um, fundamental philosophical and systematic approach to questions and concerns of healthcare that was much greater than just medicine. It was around education. It was around um, social inequities, determinants of health. It was in regard to education and literacy and how that can make a difference if you're looking at um, the empowerment of women in a particular community. And that's when it started to take shape that there were other options that I had never even begun to think about outside of medicine. And, you know, you had Doogie Howser, you had ER, you had all these, you know, MASH and other shows that gave context for, um, for doctors, but there was this whole other world that I hadn't even considered with respect to public health, and that introductory course just blew my mind. And I continued to take the steps to um, apply to medical school, um, meaning taking the pre-med courses, um, studying for the MCAT, um, taking on leadership positions, um, you know, on campus and in the community. But the big one was um, when I took the um, health educator internship with Abby Rincon, and it was a year-long commitment that um, one of the aims of that project was to be a health educator in a particular role. And that's when I realized, okay, this isn't just an interesting course that gets me thinking and that I love coming to every week. This actually could be a profession. This really could be a, a, a group of skill sets that I wanna commit myself to. And so years later, when I was applying to medical school, one of the criteria that I used to look at the medical school programs was one, I, I called it the triad, meaning that they had a, a, an academic center, they had a VA nearby that could help provide this kind of enriching and more diverse clinical um, training program, but also had a master's in public health on campus. Because by that time I had realized there's this whole other world of, um, um, you know, fundamentals that really make a difference on a very large, um, um, community-based and system-wide approach that is not fully being answered in medicine. And I want to make sure that when I go to medical school, I have the option to pursue that. And I can enrich my studying and my training um, in the medical course, but also ensure that I have that opportunity at my fingertips. And in the end, I didn't go to the University of Washington School of Public Health, I went to the East Coast. Um, but the point is, is that it really started with that introductory course that just blew my mind and just gave me so much um, excitement and inspiration for the type of work and possibilities that can be, um, you know, uh, avail um, oneself as a public health um, servant and officer. So um, that's you. what I'd share, sorry. Yeah, Thank a little you. winded. Uh, I just want to just, you know, always yeah. respect people's time. We have three minutes yeah. left. Um, some, we may not necessarily, we, we're not going to get to everyone's questions, but one just last consejo, one last piece of advice um, that, that you would have for our students pursuing a career in community health. I think the one in community health is don't give up. Because even if the certain route that you're going through, you know, becomes difficult or it's not sustainable to balance between classes or whatever, it doesn't mean that that's the end. It just means that you have to pivot and change what you're doing, get the advice from people who you trust and who have an understanding that can support you in this, but don't give up. Um, you know, my route and my experience is a perfect example that it's not a linear one and it's not always an easy path, but you can really, um, you know, years later reflect, don't give up even when you're told no or you have a difficult experience. And I would just, for those of you that are still on, I'm happy to connect with any one of you one-on-one -on -one, because I think that's where I stand to be the most useful is to kind of hear where you're coming from, 
what point are you in your, um, your health trajectory, your health professions trajectory, and how can we connect you either with myself or other individuals that I think are going to be the most helpful for the questions and uh, the steps that you're about to embark on. Thank it doesn't you. have to end here. Yeah. Perfect. And what is the best way for them to get in contact with you? We just yeah. Lily put well, up our emails, but how, how what, what works best? I think what we can do is I can, I'm happy to take the links of some of those mentorship um, opportunities that I know of both at San Jose State, um, Stanford University, UCSF, and um, some of the summer internship programs. I'll put my contact, I'll probably put my email on there um, in my cell phone, um, maybe not on this publication tonight, but um, <laughs> we can put it out <laughs> separately for those that participated today, because I think that it doesn't have to stop here. This is just a launching point, and it's really about us connecting one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendoza, for a thoughtful and engaging conversation. Um, I have a feeling that we're going to have a lot of students reach out to us. I know people that didn't get to have their question answered. I'll make sure that maybe we can find a way to get those answered for them after the fact. So thank you so much, and we hope you have a good evening. Lily, did you want to say anything else? Well, I'm seeing a lot of questions. Is there a way that we could do a snapshot for the people who posted questions and maybe I can follow up with them? Yes. I'm happy to stay on. I don't know if that's an option, but if we can't, then um, for the questions that have been posed, I know people took time to do that. I would love to, you know, circle back with you either in person or via email because I think there's some great questions that I'm yes, just looking at. They are. And I made sure to, to to contact everybody who asked a question to let them know, you know, that we would definitely get back to them. And there's a way for us to read the chat. We can we have the chat after the fact, so we could always compile something that we send out to every to, to other folks, um, to the people yeah. that attended the session. So that would be great because I know there's some great questions here, and I, I know we just didn't have as much time. I yes. probably talked too much. Well, the, the <laughs> It was all wonderful information. So we really appreciate um, you taking the time and thank you to everybody in the audience. Um, stay safe, the time to come. Stay yes. healthy, wear masks, and you know, it's we're entering winter um, and we just need to keep being diligent, um, eat, sleep, exercise, because we need you guys to succeed in your coursework. That comes first. Even as the elections approach, um, you know, our first and foremost is we need you safe and healthy and doing well in school. That comes first. And yes. voting. And we need voting. you to vote. Exactly. Yeah. We need oh, you to and vote. And hopefully everyone's voted. And early voting is now. Um, we're lucky. Um, many of the other states, I'm doing phone banking, actually, um, asking people, and I'm helping to flip um, absentee ballots that have actually been thrown out in North Carolina. So I think there's you know, if you haven't voted this weekend, put it on your to-do list <laughs> um, if you're registered in California.